we are recording and I've got Dr. Louise Phillips with me. Welcome, Louise. Oh, thanks so much for having me today, Ali. It's great to be here. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, can you just like say what you're doing at the moment and um and talk about how you how you got to using low carb in your practice? Sure. So so I'm a mainstream GP and I've been practicing for about 20 years now. And at the start of the COVID pandemic, in about nine months time, I'd gained about four kilos with very few extra carbs from the tea room, you know, a little slice of cake here, et cetera. And I just couldn't bear the thought of dieting to lose them. And then I heard Dr. Peter Bruckner uh, do a podcast and he mentioned about dropping your carbs. And so I reduced carbs and four weeks later I'd lost four kilos and for the first time in my life I wasn't starving all the time and that's also partly because I was an enormous baby when I was born I was 5.45 kilos which is 11 pound 15 and about two kilos heavier than the average newborn and so my mum had gestational diabetes and now has diabetes and my sister has diabetes so I basically have a very high uh, metabolic risk myself and so all of those reasons is why I also followed Dr. Bruckner's advice, but it was just so amazing to me. And then that just led me on a journey of looking into it further. And then I heard Professor Noakes talk about the Nutrition Network and the courses they offer there. And so I did about five of their courses. And then I did their certification pathway last year, which was actually the hardest course I've ever done in my life, like <laughs> harder than medical school training and harder than GP training of the amount of papers that we were reading and the science that we were interpreting and I just came away from it just understanding that there was a huge depth of science in all of this and it's in all the textbooks it's just that pharmaceutical companies and food companies have sort of distorted the science so yeah so that's that's pretty much my journey and so now I I help patients with metabolic syndrome that come in through my door and I'm also very passionate about helping doctors and other health practitioners as well so I have launched my website which is lowcarbscripts.com and on that I teach time management courses to doctors as well as uh, stress reduction courses and I also have got um, I'm also teaching them about low carb and keto and so I've launched two kits so far. One's the Low Carb Doctors Kit, which basically gives doctors the spiels, the images, the handouts that they need to deliver low carb advice to patients in very short frames of time. And then I've just launched on the weekend the um, Running on Time module, which has had excellent reviews from the GPs who have done it. And I figure that if you need, if you want doctors who are going to be delivering low carb advice, you need to teach them how to run on time <laughs> and you also need to teach them how to reduce stress because a lot of us are burnt out and then you can teach them how to give advice very succinctly. Mm. That all sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> I've had Peter Bruckner and David Unwin both on the podcast and yeah. uh, Peter's such a, a nice guy and um, I actually live in Liverpool now and he was the Liverpool Football Club doctor for a while and he was an elite yeah. Uh, sport doctor wasn't he for Australian yeah. cricket and a uh, fascinating career and um, I think him and David and yourself are all kind of similar in that once you you were talking about this before we started recording once you learn about the the benefits that are already in the literature and and the the textbooks if you care to look then you can't unsee it and you struck yeah, on the, it, like this phrase that you said for the first time in your life, you weren't hungry all the time. I mean, do you I think know. that is at the root of it? I think it is, you know, and my whole family get hungry and hangry all the time, such that at my medical school graduation, my family stopped at McDonald's on the way because even though there was a, a banquet dinner happening, they were starving and, and couldn't wait until they got there. So, oh, the you know, irony. so it's it's amazing to, to not feel hungry. Yeah, to just be able to, or you do feel hungry if you're properly hungry, but to just be able to regulate your body according to normal physiology. Yeah. Yeah, so what 
what's um what what do you think changes and what changes in your patients yeah so it's amazing and and this is, again is where you just can't unsee it it is as i said to you earlier the most reproducible intervention i've ever seen in my career where you can prescribe a certain diet if patients follow it they come back and they have the first things they'll say is that they've got improved energy and the brain fog is gone and so that's where i think it really has a big effect on the brain first and foremost but then they'll lose weight they'll lose um, centimeters off their waist they just have a bounce in their step their blood profile improves their hba1c comes down their lipid profile becomes less less atherogenic in that their triglycerides come down and the hdl goes up and they often will just start exercising of their own accord, you know. So all of these terrific things. And I had one lady who came to see me a couple of weeks ago and she's 75 and she got onto the diet very, very gradually just with little bits of advice here and there. But when I saw her a few weeks ago, I said, oh, I hardly see you anymore. And she said, oh, that's because you've fixed me. I just feel so well. I don't need to see you anymore. And so that was fantastic. And so I think for doctors, it's so rewarding to actually help patients regain their health. And if you're, you know, on the cusp of burnout, this is the sort of medicine that just reinstates your faith in, well, it's really in nutrition, I was going to say in medicine, but it it brings you back to why you did medicine in the first place, which is usually to help people and because you loved science. It's usually the combination of those two things. And so this really brings you back home to that. It's funny, isn't it? You know, David Unwin talks about when before his patient walked in, having essentially sent her diabetes into remission through low carb, and he got curious. Before that, he had a packet of biscuits in his desk drawer, and he would refer to patients as, you know, two biscuit patients or three biscuit patients, depending on how frustrating they were to uh, to speak to because of they were just uh he was just prescribing um more medication for them over time and uh seeing them get worse and worse and um you know it, it transforms your joy of your work um which allows you to just sort of redouble your efforts and do even more it's amazing to see oh it really is i mean I think Dr. Unwin is such an amazing doctor and he and Dr. Jen Unwin as well, just what they've done for being able to bring a model of care that is implementable in, you know, standard care and standard timed appointments. And, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, even myself, you know, I I would think, oh, maybe I'll retire in five years or, or something like that. And now I think, well, no, I could, I could actually keep working in this field I, I really am enjoying what I'm doing where I'm helping patients and helping doctors and it's just such a lovely job now hmm. yeah um you know you talked about nutrition network and Tim Noakes having set that up uh after having to kind of uh prove himself twice in court in South Africa hmm. and thinking about Gary Fetke in Australia who got this ridiculous letter didn't he saying um when he, he's an orthopedic surgeon so he was doing kind of diabetic foot amputations and limb amputations and stuff and um they they said you know he was telling his patients uh you might be able to avoid surgery if you go low carb it was as simple as that and a lot <laughs> of them did and then he got this letter saying uh you're curing people inappropriately i know it's it is so crazy and i think the wonderful thing, though, about practicing in this at this particular time is that people like Prof Noakes and Dr. Fetke have paved the way. You know, before, if you wanted to prescribe low carb medicine and say that was the house you wanted to get into, the front door was sort of blocked by pharmaceutical companies and by food industries, and doctors were sort of going around the back and like trying to climb in the windows. But now that those court cases have been there and the fact that it is in the dietary guidelines now, so it's in the Australian National Diabetes 
strategy for 2021 to 2030. And it's the Diabetes Australia put out a position statement in 2018 and the American Diabetes Association has written a whole guide about it last year. It's it's in the guidelines and the back door has been propped open a bit and people like me and you now just have to guide the doctors in there. That's that's what I figure. It's it's sort of a little bit of a, a different game to to what it was even five years ago. Yeah, that's a nice metaphor. It's almost like, you know, the, the shopping mall, um, sometimes the the best food in town is from a, you know, a, a kind of a immigrant restaurant around the corner rather than the the, the main food court. And obviously the yeah. you've got your big food companies and your pharma companies paying for the the shiny all singing, all dancing entrances. But yeah. what's really the best thing is sometimes uh, just needs a, a little signpost and, a, and word of mouth. Um, and that's what's going on. It's uh, it's it's really great to see. Um, you know, we talked before as well about niching for specific results, and you're ten, you're you, you're really you've mentioned that um, some of your patients are coming in. You know, the brain fog's gone. They're they've just got more energy. They're spontaneously exercising, um, yeah. and you're you're focusing specifically on markers of metabolic syndrome, aren't you? So is this like? Yeah. Um, similar focus to David Unwin and so on, Verta Health, where it's about uh, lab markers of type 2 diabetes, right? That's kind of your main focus. Yeah, so so the reason that I focus on metabolic syndrome and really any parameter of metabolic syndrome is because, one, it's a spectrum, and so people can have, you know, all five factors of the spectrum or might just have one factor, and I'll pull you up on it and, and invite you to come and talk to me a little bit more. Um, and two, the underlying cause is insulin resistance. And that's just something that all doctors have heard of metabolic syndrome as well. They just don't really know that the cause is insulin resistance. And it enables you to intervene into people's health trajectory at an earlier stage. So if you're dealing with end-stage disease, by the time they've got organ failure and are on 10 different tablets then I think you've missed the boat in terms of prevention. Whereas if you can keep an eye out for metabolic syndrome and see people start to go off course and become a little bit more unhealthy, so much easier to correct their health to reverse disease than to leave it right down the end. So that's that's why I, I'm interested in prevention and I intervene at that point. And, of course, I'll help people at the other end as well. Um, but I'm lucky as a doctor that I get to see all the babies and the children and the young healthy people and I sort of want to keep them on that side of health as long as possible. Yeah. Interesting that you've uh, started this course called Running on Time because one of the understandable kind of mitigations that um, you have to concede for doctors not... Mm, kind of maybe applying this kind of therapy before they were even in the guidelines or suggesting it is you, you might have in the UK sometimes five five or six minutes with a lot of patients. Mm. How do you impart meaningful lifestyle um, recommendations? Uh, you, you know, you can understand why doctors revert sometimes to prescriptions Totally. Look, it, it is, it's a hard job being a GP. That's, I, I think, you know, dealing with people of every single age, with every single possible problem in very short spaces of time, and generally also not necessarily receiving recognition or praise for the hard work that you're doing. It's, it's, it's a difficult job. And so, if you want doctors to provide nutrition, you have to be able to, one, give them essentially the script to give the nutrition script so that they can do it in a very short frame of time. And two, you need to teach them the skills to run on time. And that involves, you know, eliciting patient agenda and limiting patient agenda at the start because a big part of general practice is, is what we call chunking. So you're dividing up 
problems into little bite-sized pieces and dealing with them one piece at a time. And over a long period of time, you get to know your patient really well and all their problems, but you certainly don't try to do it in one consultation. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, when we run our small group coaching, um, patient, you know, uh, clients want to learn everything in a one hour or where I'm doing one-to-ones. Yeah. I, I run it 90 minute sessions because at the start anyway of the relationship, there's so much exchange going on and it's really hard to meaningfully truncate that. So it's an yeah. amazing skill, I think, to be able to um, distill it into something meaningful that can be kind of drip fed in a way that actually works. But you're obviously seeing that because your patients are getting better. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and definitely. And so I think another, you know, big part of this for, for me and for you probably is that you're planting a seed. And sometimes the seed will take root and will grow. And it may not happen then, it might happen in a different season, but they may come back and see you again. And so I'm, yeah, so that's that's a big part of, of I think, general practice as well. And the other thing is I think we can just target the low-hanging fruit. We don't need to target the ones that are too difficult to convince or convert. I'm not interested in doing that at all. But if someone's interested, like I'll offer it to everyone, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time you know debating with someone about it if they can come back and see me or not or I can just refer them to a helpful source like defeat diabetes or the Freshwell app in the UK you know that's that's very helpful or diet doctor saying any of those things takes 30 seconds yeah yeah, yeah that is a huge part of it isn't it you know there's this mm. um cycle of change where I know I felt it when uh I was kind of late teenager into my 20s and I noticed that I had these health issues and every probably couple of years or so I would resolve to make changes to feel better but the problem was I would act on information that wasn't very good it wasn't until I uh, learned about the, you know low carb and keto and paleo round about when I was you know 31 32 that I started to make changes that actually had very profound positive effects. But that cycle of change, it, you can't just switch it on and off. It, people are in this, um, this cycle at different stages. So it might be that they're pre-contemplation, they're not even thinking about changing. There's no point in trying to convince someone who's there. Um, you're just wasting your time and making them angry probably and I found that out the hard way um, when I uh, found out about all of this the power of lifestyle I became evangelical about it and <laughs> um, got backlash from people because I couldn't see how once you know how powerful this can be and we're talk we're not talking fringe benefits around the edges we're talking orders of magnitude changes in people's health across the board and that fundamental change that you spoke about where you're not hungry anymore in the same way you just um you're in control and it's an experiential thing it, you can t you can tell someone until they're you're blue in the face about an experience but until you experience it yourself you can't know and unless someone's ready to change they're not going to want to experience it no, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. They definitely have to be willing to change. And often there's barriers to change, such as fears of letting go of something that might have been the thing that they're relying on to relieve their stress, like food, for example. Um, or, you know, if you've got a patient who lives in a retirement village, letting go of carbs means letting go of all the social activities where there's sandwiches and cake. So understanding where the person comes from as well and coming up with some other alternatives for them, I think, can be helpful. Uh, and I do think people can step their way gradually into change. Definitely some people go all in, definitely get the best results straight away. But other people will just make 
one little change and then it's like Dr. Unwin's Gwyn model where you're noticing the difference and encouraging them. I think that's that's really important and that I've seen many people improve their life just by making little incremental changes. And what's been your experience so far of um, bringing doctors round? You know, has that been a, a spectrum of level of interest and scepticism and um, adoption and some people just trying little bits here and there, some people going all in? What's that been like? Yeah, so I guess I've done it quite carefully. So I work at a, a big training practice. There's about 20 doctors there and we have three or four registrars a year. And so for the last three years, I've been teaching the registrars in formal lunchtime sessions about diabetes, metabolic syndrome, lipids. They're my three main talks I give in it, but I'll also bring it into a little bit into other talks if I'm talking about um, antenatal care or gestational diabetes, et cetera. And so that's how I teach the registrars and they'll often sit in with me and observe what I do, which is basically show a PowerPoint to patients and give them a handout and I give the handout to the to the um, registrars as well or if I've got a medical student sitting with me, that's what they'll observe. And then for the group, we have got fortnightly lunchtime education sessions and so my boss let me give a, a few sessions to them. So the first one was on metabolic syndrome and personally I think that's the, the key one to talk to doctors about because, again, we've all heard about it and so that's... A really worthwhile thing to do and then from that I had a few people give me referrals but I did have someone stand up in that talk and say I don't believe in all this low carb baloney and blah 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 so you know it's not convincing everyone and then we myself and another GP Dr Nalam Dharmapriya we approached the PHN which is the primary health network who educate doctors on a variety of matters but it's outside of the college's jurisdiction and and so it's sort of it's government funded but they're sort of a little bit more um, flexible in what they they teach and we were able to give a talk about lipids and we had 135 doctors register which was their biggest registration ever and we also so um, had the best feedback ever for a talk and we were talking about statins and the controversies with statins and calcium scores so that was a little bit more you know out there however people were receptive to it so I think it's not so much that doctors are really totally disbelieving although I think there's many that are it's that they just don't know we, we're just not taught this at medical school and it would be so easy to teach them but we're not taught it so that's sort of my that's might be my approach in, in doing it. And now I've got this online platform to to teach doctors who want to learn. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you're filling in the gaps that medical school left out. And I suppose like there's this irony that um, <laughs> a lot of people want to hear this information from a doctor. Understandably, doctors are, tr are trustworthy. It's like a, a kind of um, shortcut to understanding who to trust, uh, you know, if they went through that level of, uh rigorous education and you know they've obviously you know they're not daft they've got some yeah. basic level of iq that means that they can they're capable um, and yeah. then people are willing to trust them but the irony there is that they are uh having to kind of unlearn what they learned a little bit and also learn stuff that they never learned in the first place you know i don't know what it's like in australia but in the uk it's probably literally you could count on one hand the number of lectures in five years that um, medical students get on nutrition. Yeah. And you know what? I, I cannot even remember one. I'm, I'm sure there probably was one there, and I pretty much attended all the lectures because I was that sort of student. But I can, I can remember being taught about the gut and physiology, but I just don't really remember being taught about nutrition at all. Yeah. So, which is terrible, isn't it, given that, um it is what makes us healthy <laughs> literally isn't it so yeah yeah i had michelle so, hearn on podcasts her book the dietitian's dilemma where people want to turn to her because she's a dietitian but the irony being that she rejected the notions of mainstream dietitians 
to make herself and now her clients better. Um, So that's really, that's amazing that you got the biggest turnout for one of these talks and very interesting that it's government funded, but slightly outside. It's that sort of showing people in by the back door again. Yeah, exactly. I think that, and that's exactly what Dr. Nalum said to me when she asked me, do you want to do this talk with me? And she had a bit of a link in with the PHN as well. And we'd just finished watching a or listening to a lecture at the low carb down under conference and they were talking about cancer treatments and how even if you block all the glucose coming into the cell you can't block glutamate which is sort of the backdoor entry into the cell and what can keep the cancer going from an energy point of view and they and Nalam said to me this is this is the backdoor entry this is like glutamate and I was like okay yeah yeah that sounds good I'll I'll give this talk with you so that was and that was yeah that was really good but I think there must be lots of backdoor entries out there I think there must be lots of little pathways there and it's a little bit like a street directory the main highways blocked but there's so many other little routes and little seeds that you can plant and people you can talk to or you know paths you can follow it's just a matter of of trying to tap on tap on doors I guess yeah Hmm. isn't it funny how you know you say it's already in the literature it's already in the textbooks if you care to look and now it's in the guidelines and so people Hmm. who are skeptical are being skeptical of something that's just so well established that skepticism looks ridiculous and I think that process can actually happen really quickly can't it because you had people like Gary Fecky people like uh, Tim Noakes come under legal um, not just uh, medical registration uh, boards or or colleges um, scrutiny but legal scrutiny and um, passing with flying colours and then all of a sudden it seems that these recommendations are now in the guidelines because it's just become untenable to fight it um wholesale yeah i think i think that though although they're in some guidelines and enough guidelines for me to feel quite comfortable prescribing these diets i mean i would probably be comfortable even if they weren't in the guidelines but i feel more comfortable and helping doctors to feel more comfortable the medical schools and the colleges and things like that it's not in the right guidelines yet you know so the heart foundation for instance you know, is still very focused on LDL lowering and saturated fat. And so that's that's where you still may not be able to um, get a foot into some institutions, I think, to teach people about this. But if doctors are willing to learn about it, and that's the thing is I guess it's having the time and the energy to learn about it as well. You know, COVID's, I'm sure, been worse over there than it has been over here, but it's been exhausting and to have to deal with and so I think that a lot of doctors are at that burnout point and they don't want to spend like I have thousands of hours learning this um, but they might be willing to spend a few hours Mm -hmm. yeah you you know you talked about maybe some resistance from bigger institutions or education institutions because you've obviously Mm -hmm. got passion for teaching doctors this stuff passion for teaching and I wonder if um, there is a way to get into the medical schools. I think that's starting to happen a little bit here with, um, you know, uh, Royal College of GPs, you know, David, I've been quite uh, uh, active there. And um, there is kind of some activity in medical schools that there's some leeway for different teaching to come in beyond the curriculum, if you like. Yeah. Look, I think there, I think there is still a leeway. I think there still is a a, a possible way in there. So, uh, you know, even one example would be, you know, offering to teach medical students who are interested in learning about low carb keto diets, even if that was just for themselves. You know, teaching them about it, giving them some resources so that they could help themselves or other people with it when they graduated. That that would be a really good. Um, intervention because medical students are very receptive to learning. 
So the other way is that I think with with colleges like GP training colleges and, and that, I think that there, there could be some ways in that you could be one of the doctors that teaches a lecture at their small group learnings, for instance. I haven't yet done that yet, but I'm hoping to get sort of enough feedback back from my courses to be able to approach them in that way because I'm I'm a I'm certified with the you know College of GPs in Australia as a I'm a clinical teacher where I go in and sit in with GPs and observe them consulting for a few hours at a time as well as being a supervisor so I've got a few links that I could possibly look at there it's just a matter of doing it in a way that um they'd be receptive to and I know there's a a doctor in Melbourne that I was talking to this week and he has is you know has the opportunity to give a lecture at Monash University in Melbourne to medical students about diabetes and they mainly want it on diabetes and medication but he might have you know five minutes or you know whatever to talk about low carb because he finds that most of the questions he gets are about low carb at the end anyway and even if you've just mentioned it I think it gives it credibility. And then if a few people have asked questions about it, there clearly is interest about it. And if you can point them in the direction of a helpful, concise resource, then that's, you know, then you've you've planted a few seeds. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, you see potential, um, any potential resistance where there's this, like, um, you've seen lowering of risk in terms of, you know, atherosclerosis risk uh whereas the sort of institutions uh the court the the coronary disease institutions are still kind of lingering on the old um any ldl is bad and uh, any saturated fat will make it worse and mm -hmm. it, you know it's it's kind of they're like you know dinosaur institutions you you, you know you, even sort of very conservative cardiologists will say you know, just plug your numbers into the, the risk calculators. LDL hardly features. And even then, it seems likely that it's more about the sort of the small dense ones. And it's, it is it, it is opposition from large institutions, but it seems like it's got to crumble at some point, don't you think? Yeah, I do think so. I mean, I was in, in the talk that I was giving for the PHN, you know, one of the, the studies that I was, I was quoting, it was sort of talking about, the the different um rate like the different ability of different ratios to predict risk because that's what we're trying to do is just predict risk and you know ldl and total cholesterol is, is terrible for predicting risks whereas the you know, ratios like total cholesterol hdl ratio for instance or oxidized ldl which is more dense ldl much better at predicting risk and one of the lines in this paper was it is almost universally agreed amongst clinicians and epidemiologists that um that we shouldn't be relying on ldl to to quantify risk and this is a, a paper from a few years ago i can't quite remember the name of it just offhand now but i was thinking to myself well no one told the gps no one's told the car the cardiologist this and yet it's true that we do not use cholesterol and we do not use ldl in any risk calculators it's it's ratios that gets used or it's you know a few other metrics that get put in so it it is hard to believe that something that when you look at the science is such a no-brainer of of what we should be looking at but it's in terms of with the journals that, that get published you know there's such a wealth of information that's out there but doctors if they read them would read the abstract and the abstract is basically a tabloid magazine version of what's actually in the study. And to go through and actually read what's in the study takes, well, it takes hours to actually analyse the results in terms of number needed to treat and, and this and that and to look at all the figures carefully. So when you're time poor, you might just read the abstract and particularly you might read the one that the drug rep gave you. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's got to be part of all of this, doesn't it? That um, studies are expensive and pharmaceutical companies are well placed to fund them. And if they don't say what they want them to say, then they might not 
publicise them. And if they do, yeah. then they will. So what doctors end up reading can be quite prejudiced. And I think the other thing is that the fact that nutrition research is so difficult to do, and there's a researcher called Chris Webster who's you know works with the Nutrition Network, and he sort of gives the analogy of an egg. So if you're doing a questionnaire and asking people, well, you know, how many eggs did you eat last year? <laughs> okay, that for one is flawed. But say if they can answer that accurately and you're trying to work out the different effects that has on the body, you know, what time of day did they eat their egg? What did they eat it with? What's their gut biome like? What are their other metabolic conditions? All these other factors that might affect the influence of the egg, and that's just studying one little thing. And then is it the cholesterol in the egg or is it the choline in the egg? You know, so it can, or the protein. So to assess nutrition is is very difficult and the pharmaceutical companies really, I think, use that and exploit that fact, whereas we as humans eat food, you know, whole food, and of some people a fake food as well but essentially we can assess and we can see the effect on the whole body and it's incredible the effect that it has yeah, yeah. i mean even kevin hall doing his metabolic ward studies in america where everything's controlled to the nth degree it still doesn't mean that the uh the diets that are formulated are the best you know they'll always be debated about um, how you define what diets you're giving and how you make them up and everything. It's very, very difficult, isn't it? There's just so many moving parts, even when it's as controlled as can be. Um, and I wonder if, right, regarding mental health, you know, you've said that your patients seem uh, sparkier, that uh, the, the brain fog's gone a lot of the time. And I wonder if it actually makes it harder to both uh, define benefits and um, oppose the the mode modality the treatment modality and um, compared to say uh old-fashioned lipidologists saying oh well ldl cholesterol can go up on a, on a ketogenic diet there isn't actually a lab test for mental disorders it's based on questionnaires and um symptom lists from the the dsm right so um i wonder if it's actually it's it's a bit of a strength but also a bit of a weakness with how powerful they can be for you know, these diets can be for mental disorders that on the one hand, um, you don't actually have a lab number to prove that you are better. But on the other hand, yeah. you it's harder to oppose by saying, oh, there's this, uh, there's this marker that might go up. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... And, you know, as much as questionnaires can try to quantify mental health, uh, they... They don't really tell the whole picture because people are so much more complex than the 10 questions or whatever that we we ask them. So, yeah, I just, I can't quite remember the question, but I think that, what was it again, Ali? It, 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 it was more of a, it was more of a thought salad that I threw at you. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I just think that your whole health rests on your mental health and if people don't have mental health then they don't have much. And if I'm trying to help people with their physical health, unless their mental health is in a certain spot, it's it's not possible to work with them in some other ways. And so for some people, the initial thing that I will try to help them with is is with psychology and and just basic stuff like habits and things like that. And referring to a psychologist or a health coach, et cetera. Yeah. Where do you think you've seen the, the, the best results with mental health with your patients? Um, I probably would have to say anxiety and depression, anxiety and depression, I think. I, I don't see, I'm sure that it has benefits in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, et cetera, but I don't have a lot of those patients who are pursuing a dietary approach. So whereas anxiety and depression is very common in general practice, only really one in five patients will be having it at any one time. So I see 
those improve a lot. Yeah. And your practice is uh, associated with or attached to psychiatry practice that uses ketamine, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we've got uh, our practice principal has got a special interest in psychiatry as well as um, teaching. And there's a, a separate part of the clinic where there's two psychiatrists and a psychiatry registrar and a, a few GPs who have got special interests in psychiatry. And they see patients and if they've, with the ketamine program, they have to have failed two antidepressants or not failed, but not had lack of response to two antidepressants and also be suitable candidates. And then they are given ketamine via uh, troches, which are, yeah, uh, compounded for them. And then they're followed up and, and managed through that clinic as well. And they're, they're having some good results with that. But at this stage... I don't think anyone's practicing nutritional psychiatry. Yeah, there's this, um, you know, these theories about why ketamine and SSRIs and various other modes can help people. Um, and and for me, there's a lot in common with things like meditation and, you know, appropriate nutrition in that it allows you to have an appropriate distance from your response to the world so uh you know serotonin is sometimes associated with how um distanced your kind of mind's eye if you like is from your um experience of the world or from stimuli i should say so mm -hmm. for example if you feel pain then if you're in a resilient place you'll recognize the pain it's there for a reason you've evolved to feel pain but mm -hmm. you can feel enough distance from it that you you don't identify as the pain it's not so close to you that you are the pain and it's just unbearable so you can say oh there's pain i'll do something about it and then it's gone and um, and i wonder if dissociatives like ketamine can move you away from your pain enough that you can see that and Sometimes serotonin can uh, bring you back to uh, a place that's close enough to deal with it properly. And that's a very simplistic view of a very complex area. But I do think that mod modalities like meditation, proper nutrition, um, ketamine, serotonin, and so on, um, they all have certain commonalities. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that, Anything that can help train the brain and enable you to have that space between reacting and responding, you know, so that you can make sense of things a little bit more is is what you need. And it sometimes doesn't take that long, does it? Like it might be that little six-second pause um, and just becoming aware and recognising it. Having said that, a lot of people have experienced so much trauma in the past that that they are so so damaged as a result that they need a lot more help to to heal i guess yeah mm -hmm. yeah trauma comes up a lot when talking about um psilocybin or ketamine or any of these things which do cool us away from our reality a little bit and mm -hmm. people talk about in the language of resetting um like a factory reset almost and like georgia ead said you, you wish you could wave a wand and make people what something you know pe traumatic things that happen to people just go away as if it never happened but you can't so how how do you um the question i guess is how how does one impart resilience and i think in my experience proper diet and lifestyle goes a long way there to empower people to be able to deal with that trauma. Yeah, definitely. I mean, given that, you know, when you, with your gut, you know, sort of 50% of your dopamine and 90% of your serotonin gets made by your gut, it it is so intrinsic to your mental health, the food that you eat. And 
if you think about chemicals that we even put on our skin, you know, for instance, for women, hormone replacement therapy, very helpful medication for some women, but it can have such amazing effects on their mood and their body and how they feel. And similarly, things that you put inside your gut, inside your body, have a big influence on on how you feel and and what things get created. And it's just that we've become very distanced from that fact. Absolutely. I feel like that's a, a good place to stop because it all starts in the gut. So let's uh, let's stop it at the gut. Um, <laughs> where can people find you, Louise? Yeah, so I'm available to consult at the Albany Hills Radius Medical Centre, which is in Brisbane, Australia. And I'm available through my online courses at www.lowcarbscripts.com. Brilliant. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I think you're doing uh, amazing work and more power to you. Thanks so much, Ali. It's been so nice talking to you. Thanks for listening or watching the Ali Houston Transforms podcast, everyone. Um, please do hit subscribe wherever you're watching or listening so you don't miss out on future episodes. And please do leave a review. It just takes 10 seconds and it really helps get these messages out there. And if yourself or anyone you know could benefit from a mental health tune-up, head over to metsci.com where myself and psychiatrist Dr. Rachel Brown coach you to better mental health.